Welcome to lecture three. Uh, today we're going to look at safety factors and axial deformation. So we'll get started by looking at the safety factor bit. And we'll uh, do that by uh, first considering um, designing a table. Uh, maybe it's a table that you just have uh, in one of those lecture theaters at the university that we're all uh, missing right now. Um, something, you know, really basic like that. Okay, so if you're if you're designing the steel legs um, for this table, uh, we can we can use our knowledge of stress and material properties to um, appropriately dimension those legs so that under under the load that we expect the table to withstand those steel legs will not break. Um, but the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we define what load those legs should be able to take? You know, um, a, table, a table like this is used for writing, so it really doesn't have to hold much weight. Um, but we know that at some point, you know, some, somebody is going to uh, get up there and stand on that table. For, for some reason. And you know, relative to that person that I've drawn, it looks like there's, you know, room for, for a couple of more people up there. So probably at some point we're gonna be having, you know, a few people standing standing on that table. And you know, then maybe maybe they're maybe they're jumping um, up and up and down. Um, and that's 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 even even more load. So, um, what what load do we actually uh, design the legs of the table to withstand? Um, well, the the sort of the general idea here is that it's it's kind of impossible to say what the actual load that that table uh, will withstand in service is because we we know it's going to be misused relative to what it's being designed for the purpose that it's being designed for. And this, this happens all the time in engineering where we don't have a precisely defined loading situation for the, the object that we're engineering um, due, to, due to a variety of factors. So in design, we always include what's called a safety factor. And a safety factor simply means that we're going to over-design um, a component or an object by a certain factor to account for unknowns, things like unknown uh, loads. So the way we do that is by saying that the uh, allowable force that will let um, an object reach for the maximum loading scenario that we can uh, reasonably predict is going to be the force that would cause the object to fail divided by some safety factor SF. Okay, here SF is our safety factor. Okay. So another way to look at this is um, that our, our load that is required to cause failure will be the maximum design load that we predicted multiplied by the safety factor. So if the safety factor is two, for example, that means we're over designing uh, by a factor of two, or the, the force that cause the force that's needed to cause failure is actually going to be twice the maximum load that we predict to occur. Now, um, most of the time, in uh, or not most of the time, but a, a large proportion of the time, we're dealing with uh, ductile materials, ductile metals. Um, in engineering, and we know from our previous lecture 
the the stress strain curve for uh, ductile metals looks something like that where we've got this special point here that's the yield point defined by a stress that's the yield stress and once that stress is has been surpassed then the object becomes permanently deformed and will not regain its original dimensions when unloaded and for most engineering applications we don't want objects that we design to deform permanently when they're subjected to high loads so for failure uh, in most situations we we define failure as being the yield point um, for a material and not the ultimate stress sigma u okay so we can take our equation here and say for ductile materials right this is usually let's uh, do this uh, usually we replace this with the allowable load will be the force required to cause the material to yield divided by the safety factor and if we have a situation where stress is directly proportional to load as will be the case for all of the problems that we do in this course then we can replace force in this equation by stress so if uh, stress is proportional to force then we can say that the allowable stress in an object will be the yield stress divided by the safety factor okay and that's really the expression that's going to come in most handy in this course and of course if we're dealing with shear stress uh, that could be the allowable shear stress is the shear yield strength divided by the safety factor if we're dealing with a brittle material instead of a ductile material and there is no yield stress then we'd use the ultimate stress in place of the yield stress so it would be the allowable stress equals the ultimate stress divided by the safety factor in that case so let's uh let's go ahead and get a fresh page here and do an example uh just to uh show how how this is used uh numerically okay so example um let me try and draw a uh, a helicopter here um do, 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 do. okay that's a it's a pretty ugly helicopter but that's okay slap on a tail rotor here good now this is going to be one of those helicopters that um fights fires so it's got or helps fight fires so it's got a cable hanging from it and the cable goes to uh, a sort of a bucket like this that scoops up water from a lake um, and drops it drops it on the fire okay and what we're going to do is we're going to look at designing um, this this cable here so let's put in a couple of numbers so they will say that um, we have a, a cable um, that has the following properties it's going to be a steel cable with a yield strength of 250 megapascals um, a modulus of elasticity of 200 gigapascals and we'll say that the cable is 50 meters long and uh, this bucket here has a capacity of 10,000 uh, liters let's say so it can scoop up 10,000 liters of water in in one go so the question that we'll ask is uh, what is the minimum required diameter of that cable 
for a safety factor of 3.5. All right, so min required diameter of the cable for safety factor of 3.5 is our question mark. And we'll also say that we want to round to the nearest five millimeters, okay? Because we know we can't just go out and buy, um, let's say a steel cable in any diameter we want. They're probably, uh, we could get them in increments of five millimeters maybe. Uh, so that seems reasonable, okay. So the first thing to do is look at the um, loading situation that the uh, cable is actually under. So let's do a section cut through our cable here and draw the free body diagram, okay? So we've got um, our cable cut like this, okay? And we've got the load on it from the uh, weight of the water, call that WW, and then in the other direction we just have the normal force in the cable. So some of the forces in the Y direction has to be uh, zero if this thing is uh, static or not accelerating at least, so we've got normal force is equal to the weight of the water. Weight of the water is easy to calculate um, because we know the capacity of the um, of the scoop here. The bucket is 10,000 liters, so we can do uh, 10,000 liters multiplied by one kilogram per liter, right? Multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared to change that into newtons. Uh, so we've got a load and an internal normal force of 98,100 newtons. Okay, so now we can go and look at uh, calculating stress. So what we wanna do here is say that the allowable stress that we're gonna reach, the stress that we're going to allow that cable to reach is going to be equal to the yield stress divided by the safety factor and then we're going to set that equal to the stress that's in the cable which is going to be the normal force divided by the cross-sectional area so we'll take this side of the expression uh, here and move it down to the next line and fill in some numbers here so we've got 250 times 10 to the 6, 250 megapascals. Remember, you want everything in pascals, newtons, meters here. Our safety factor of 3.5 equals our normal force, which we said was 98,100, divided by our cross-sectional area, pi over 4 d squared. Okay. So from this, we get a value of D that comes out to be uh, 41.8 millimeters. That actually comes out of the equation in, uh, in units of meters and then multiply by 1,000 to get millimeters, of course. Now, we need to round that to the nearest 5 millimeters. It's closer to 40, but if we were to round that down to 40, then making this number smaller here would end up making our stress go above the limit, the design limit that we have uh, for the yield stress of 250 megapascals, which means that our safety factor would um, not be 3.5 anymore, right? So we wouldn't, we wouldn't have an allowable stress of 250 divided by 3.5 anymore. It would be greater, greater than that. So our safety factor would be below 3.5. And we can't have that if our design safety factor was 3.5. So we need to round this up to 45 millimeters. So that would be our answer there. Okay, so let's look at a, um, let's look at a different axial deformation actually. Um, so another question that we could, okay. 
So another question that we could ask about this problem that might be of interest is we know we have a, a 50 uh, meter long cable here. Um, when we scoop up the 10,000 liters of water, 50, 50 meters is the unloaded length. We always show dimensions on these sketches with the uh, unloaded geometries. So when the 10,000 liters is scooped up, we might want to know how much the cable elongates by. And that brings us to axial deformation. So axial deformation. Okay, so axial deformation uh, is really concerning questions that try and answer how much longer uh, does something uh, become or, or what is the length change of something under load okay so what is length change under load any anything that deals with that sort of question is an axial deformation problem now we can get um, a nice little expression for axial deformation just from our equation relating stress and strain in the linear region of the um, of the stress strain curve so from Hooke's law so we've got in the linear region we've got stress is proportional to strain and the constant of pro proportionality is the modulus of elasticity so we have stress equals modulus of elasticity times strain and this is true if we're uh, dealing with stresses that are below the yield stress of the material. Okay, so let's take that expression uh, for uh, Hooke's law here, and uh, we'll we'll expand it out using the equations for stress and strain. So. Just going to write that again here. So we've got uh, stress equals modulus of elasticity times strain. We know that stress is normal force divided by cross sectional area, and strain is change in length divided by original length. And I'll just call that L there. So if we do some rearranging for delta L, right, we get delta L is NL over AE. And that's the equation for uh, axial deformation. Okay, so n the internal normal force, l uh, the unloaded length of an object, uh, a its cross-sectional area, and e modulus of elasticity. There. Okay, so returning to uh, returning to our helicopter, let's let's ask that question. So um, for our helicopter example. What is the delta L for the uh, cable, right? And when we're considering that, we'll, we'll 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 be wanting to use the the rounded diameter of the cable since that's what we'd actually uh, buy and um, and install. So that's that's the cable. Um, that would actually be deforming, so we'd want to use that. So let's let's do that. So we've got delta L is our internal normal force from that previous problem was 98,100 newtons. There we go. The length, unloaded length, was 50 meters divided by cross-sectional area, pi divided by 4, and then this is where we use the 45 millimeters. Here, the rounded, uh, square that, and then modulus of elasticity, we said 200 gigapascals. Remember, we want everything in Newton Pascals meters here, so that's 200 times 10 to the 9. So, length change from that is going to come out of the equation in units of meters. So, we've got 0 0.154 meters, which is uh, 15.5 four millimeters. Okay, so uh, when we scoop up that 10,000 liters of water, that cable is going to be 
become 15.4 millimeters longer uh, than it originally was in the unloaded condition. Okay, um, so let's let's look at a sort of a different axial deformation uh, question now. Um, so what if we had something that uh, looked like this? Let's say we've got um, a flat bar that's attached to a wall maybe and um, it's got loads that are positioned on it at a couple of different points maybe we have a load there um, and we'll just call this uh, f applied maybe at point a that's point a there and then we've got another load f b here applied at point b um, and maybe we've got you know maybe even another load here let's say f c and this is at point C. And uh, what we want to know is the um, total change in length of the of the object. So this this is a situation where um, our equation delta L N L divided by A E. You can only apply this equation to um, an object or a section of the object that has a constant value of n l or n a and e over l um, so over length l the normal force n the cross-sectional area a the modulus of elasticity e can't be changing over l when you when you apply this equation now here we've got a situation where because there's differing externally applied loads on the object the internal normal force is going to change over its length so the way to handle a situation like this is by using what's called superposition um, applied to axial deformation. And what superposition is, is just saying that we're going to take the length changes of segments of the object where constant, uh, that do have a constant normal force area modulus of elasticity and add those length changes together. Okay, so in other words, if this is point D over here on the wall and we want the total change in length, what we're really asking for is delta L A D. And what we'd say is that can be uh, calculated as the sum of the length changes for the different segments of that object that have constant normal force. Um, area modulus of elasticity. So here we'd have delta L from A to B plus delta L from B to C plus delta L from C to D. Okay. Um, so we'd calculate all those different length changes for those three segments that have constant internal normal force along their length. Um, and add them all together to give us a resultant total length change. Now, when you're doing superposition uh, like this, so this is called superposition. Okay. Um, when you're doing superposition like this, it's important to realize that some segments of the object might be getting longer and some segments of the object might be getting shorter and it's going to be important to appropriately add or subtract those so we should assign um, a mathematical convention to whether uh, an elongation is positive or a contraction is uh, negative. Um, so we, we do exactly that and we do that by saying that in our equation for um, axial deformation, NL over AE, we are always going to take compressive normal forces and make those negative. So that contractions uh, appear as negative values and elongations are positive values. Okay, so when applying 
super position always make compressive normal forces negative values okay so let's um, let's do an example uh, then and look at that so example dun, 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 dun. okay what have we got here okay let's say we have um, a an aluminum rod here that is on a roller and a pin so it's laying down horizontally like this okay there we go um, and it's going to be uh, a 10 millimeter diameter aluminum rod okay and let's put on those uh, that roller there okay and maybe we'll put on the pin over here good now let's put some externally applied loads on so let's put a load here that's six kilonewtons and then let's put a load on over here that's 10 kilonewtons and then let's put a load on over here that's one kilonewton Okay, and we'll grab some uh, dimensions there. We'll say that from the end of the rod to the 10 kilonewton load is one meter, and then from the 10 kilonewton to the one kilonewton is three meters, and then from the one kilonewton load to the pin is one and a half meters. Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, let's let's get some more numbers here. So we'll say that for that aluminum, uh, we have um, so for the aluminum, we have the following material properties known. We have a yield strength or yield stress of 265 megapascals and a modulus of elasticity of 70 uh, gigapascals. And what we want to know is when those loads shown are applied, what is the total change in length of the rod? So total change in length um, when loaded. Okay. All right. Um, so. This is, uh, this is a superposition problem because we've got multiple points of load application, so it's going to cause the internal normal force to vary in a discrete manner over the length of the object, and whenever we have um, an internal normal force varying in a discrete fashion, we need to use superposition for axial deformation. So the first thing to do is identify the differing internal normal forces here. And we'll start just by labeling our, our points. So this point where the six kilonewton load is applied, we'll just call that point A. Uh, this is point B, point C, and over here where the pin is, that will be uh, point D. So then we can keep all of our stuff neat and tidy. So first let's get the normal force between uh, point A and point B. So we do that by just taking a section cut here uh, between those two and drawing the free body diagram. So we've got six kilonewtons applied uh, as our external load. And then we know that for an internal section cut, we can have a normal force, shear force, um, internal moment. Uh, some of the forces in the y direction says the shear force is going to be zero here. Some of the moments, so the internal moment is going to be zero. So we only have an internal normal force um, and that needs to counterbalance that six kilonewton load. So NAB is going to be six kilonewtons here. Okay, we've got that one. So next section cut between B and C. Remember, you never want a section cut at a point of load application, always between points of load application. Um, so that section cut looks like this, where we've got our 
six kilonewton load here, and then we've got 10 kilonewtons here. Again, some of the forces in the x direction has to be zero, so we know that our internal normal force, NBC, has to be equal to four kilonewtons. One final section cut to make to get the last internal normal force. So that's between point C and point D. Let's uh, get rid of that line and oops, there we go. Perfect. Okay, here's our object. There's that section cut between point C and point D. And we've got our six kilonewton load, our 10 kilonewton load there, and our one kilonewton load there. So now some of the forces in the x direction says that NCD has to be equal to three kilonewtons. Okay, so um, now we've got our internal uh, internal normal forces. So looking at our equation for axial deformation, delta L is NL over AE, right? Um, we said this is a 10 millimeter diameter. So uh, A is constant along length. It's all aluminum, so E is constant over length. Uh, so the only thing that's changing over length is normal force. And now we know how the normal force changes with length. We've got three, three values of normal force. So we need to break the object up into three different segments and add all of those changes of length together. So what we'll do is we'll just say that the length change, total length change, which is the length change from point A to point D, is going to be the sum of the length changes for the individual segments, and that's the length change for the segment from A to B plus the length change from B to C plus the length change from C to D, okay? Now, uh, it's just um, a case of expanding each of these three terms on the right hand side out using the equation for axial deformation and we do that when we do that we just um, add the the appropriate subscripts for the section that we're dealing with to all of the equations um, so I'm gonna just grab this and move it to the next page so that we have it to look at so copy and we'll pop it in here like that okay so we said that the total length change from a to d is going to be the length change from a to b plus the length change from b to c plus the length change from c to d okay so let's expand those out so the length change from a to b is the normal force in a b plus the length of segment a b right and that's only the length of segment AB divided by the cross-sectional area and modulus. And here, since um, since the whole object has a constant cross-section and constant modulus of elasticity, uh, we won't add subscripts to those since they're the same for all terms. So then we've got the normal force in BC, the length of BC, a e plus 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 the normal force in CD, the length of CD over A and E. Okay, um, now we can start filling in some numbers here. So we'll factor out the um, factor out the A and E and divide the whole equation uh, by that, or the whole numerator by that common denominator. So first of all, normal force AB. So let's flip back to our sketches of the section cuts. So here's the normal force in AB. Now it's six kilonewtons. The important thing to do is look at the direction of the normal force. So it's pressing in on the section cut, which means that it's compressive. So when we pop that 6,000 uh, newtons into our equation here, we wanna make sure that it's negative, okay? Now the length of segment AB is one meter, OK? 
Okay, now we'll move on to our next term here. We've got the normal force in BC. So we'll flip back to our other page. Uh, so the normal force in BC was four kilonewtons and it is tensile, right? So we've got a, an internal normal force pulling away from the cut section here. So it's a tensile normal force. So it goes in our equation as a positive value. So we've got 4,000 newtons multiplied by the length and the length of just segment BC, which is three meters. Um, it's, it's quite common uh, for people when they're considering what number to put in there uh, to look back at their section cut and want to use the total length of this section and take three and add on one and make that number four and that's 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 not correct to do it's just the length of the segment that we're dealing with okay so we've got our three there and then we've got the normal force in segment cd let's flip over so it was uh three uh it's a tensile normal force so we've got plus three kilonewtons, 3,000 newtons, uh, length of 1.5 meters, and then this is all divided by a common denominator, which is pi divided by 4. Let's check the diameter. It was 10 millimeters, so it's 0 0.01 squared, and the modulus of elasticity, which was 70 gigapascals, 70 times 10 to the 9. Okay, so that's going to give us our total uh, length change. So crunching those numbers, we get 0 0.00191, and that's coming out in units of meters, uh, which means we've got 1.9 millimeters. Okay. And that comes out as a positive value, um, and that means that it's an elongation. Right, so we'll just put that in brackets to make it make it clear. If if the number came out to be a negative, that would mean that overall um, the length from A to D contracts. Now, before we leave this problem uh, in the dust, uh, one thing that you should note with these these axial deformation problems is that the equation that we set up, which was or developed, which was N L divided by uh, AE. We did that based on, remember, uh, Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law is only true if we're below the yield stress in, in a material. So if the stress at any point in this rod exceeds the yield stress, then the analysis that we've done uh, isn't valid. So what we should really do is just confirm that there's no point in this object, uh, in this aluminum rod, that exceeds the material's uh, yield, yield strength. So just flipping back, the yield strength was 265 megapascals. And we could uh, see here uh, the different internal uh, normal forces. So we know that the maximum normal stress is going to occur in the segment with the maximum normal force, and that's the, the six kilonewton um, segment. So we can calculate what the normal stress in that segment is here. Um, so this is, this is just a check here. Uh, so let's calculate what the normal stress is in segment AB. Okay, so that's the normal force in AB divided by the area and we've got 6,000 divided by pi over 4 multiplied by 0 0.01 or 10 millimeters squared. Okay, and that gives us a stress of 76.4 megapascals, um, which is okay because it's below our sigma y, which was 265 MPa. So uh, nothing, nothing wrong with the analysis 
that we've just done in this case. So that's just that's an important check to do um, when you do these problems. Okay. All right. Um, so that's um, that's superposition. So let's let's look at a slightly different type of uh, problem now. Let's do a, let's do another example uh, problem here. Okay, so in this example problem, um, let's say that we have a concrete column that is poured and cast in uh, a horizontal conformation. So this is going to be um, a 10 inch by 10 inch uh, concrete column okay um, so it's poured poured uh, or cast horizontally um, cast horizontally and then when it's put into service it is tipped vertically upright okay. there we go so it goes from being horizontal to uh, vertical. And let's say when it was uh, poured, um, it was poured in a, in a mold or a form that was 100 uh, feet long. And the concrete has a, uh, a specific weight of 0 0.086 pounds per cubic inch and a modulus of elasticity of 4.2 times 10 to the 3 uh, KSI, typical value uh, for, for concrete. And um, what we want to know is when that column is tipped upright, how much shorter does it become just due to its own weight uh, pressing, pressing down? Okay, so... Uh, when tipped up, what is the length change? Okay. All right. Um, so this this questions this questions a little bit different here uh, because if you think about what's what's going on, if we cut through the column up here right and look at the free body diagram of just that one section cut what we've got is a, a little bit of column that would have uh, some weight uh, let's call it w1 here and our internal normal force would be equal to that weight okay now if we cut the column lower down here then we've got a free body diagram that looks like this, where in the center of gravity for that uh, sectioned piece, we have a larger weight, W2, acting downwards, and consequently a much larger internal normal force acting upwards. So this is a situation where looking at our equation for axial deformation, delta L is NL over AE, we can't use this equation um, in its current form to be applied to this problem because our internal normal force in this question is varying in a continuous manner over the length of the column rather than in a discrete manner. Um, so you could chop the column up into uh, smaller and smaller sections and uh, use, use this equation and apply superposition and add them all together. But we, we know that there's a smart mathematical way to do that, and that's by changing this equation into an integral form. So um, the integral form of the axial deformation equation is delta L is the integral from 0 to L of n dL over AE. Okay, so 
here we go so that's the form that you want to use if either the normal force or the cross-sectional area varies in a continuous manner with length um, we don't often encounter things where the modulus of elasticity is varying uh, continuously with length. So I'm going to draw the column again here, okay, resting on its base there. So um, looking looking at that equation for uh, delta L again, we have back here. So looking at that equation for delta L again, we have delta L is um, the integral of N D L over A E. So our cross-sectional area, that's easy, 10 inches by 10 inches. Modulus of elasticity, that's easy. Uh, we, we were given that value. So the only thing that we need to solve this equation is we need um, the internal normal force. And we want that as a function of uh, length along the column, so variable L. So that's, that's easy to get. All you need to do is cut the column um, at some position uh, L, right, variable L, and draw the free body diagram. So if we do that here, we've got free body diagram that looks like this, where this distance here is variable L, and we know that we've got the weight of that section of the column, and that's balanced by the internal normal force. So some of the forces in the y direction has to be equal to zero. We get our internal normal force is equal to the weight of that section of the column, and the weight is equal to uh, the specific weight multiplied by the volume, which is equal to the specific weight multiplied by the area multiplied by length. Okay, so the specific weight of the concrete was 0.086 pounds per inch cubed, and then cross-sectional area, we had a 10-inch squared column, and then our variable L here. So we've got 8.6 L, and that's our expression for our normal force as a function of L. Now, one thing to pay attention to uh, when you do this is that our uh, value for specific weight here is in pounds per inch cubed. And then these two numbers here are both in inches. And if we want a force that is in pounds, then L also has to be in inches here. Um, in terms of the way we've written this equation. So that's something to remember when we set up our integral, uh, which, which we'll do now. So we've got delta L is the integral from 0 to 100 feet, but because L is in inches in our expression for the normal force, we want to multiply this 100 feet by 12 inches per foot to give us the limit of the integral in inches. And then we've got our expression for n, and this is a compressive uh, load here, so we can put it in our equation as a negative, and then uh, we'll get a length change that's negative because, of course, this column is going to uh, contract um, due to the compressive load within it. It's not going to elongate. Um, that's kind of obvious, so you don't actually need to put in the negative sign here in, in this sort of problem, um, but we can we can do that. Um, 8.6L, and then we've got our DL, and then divided by our area, which is 10 by 10, and our modulus of elasticity, 4.2 times 10 to the 3 KSI, and we want this in PSI, so this needs to be times 10 to the 6. Uh, PSI. Okay, so uh, pop that into your uh, pop that into your calculator and hit solve, and we get a length change that's minus 0 0.0147 inches. Okay, so 
there we go um so we've covered um our safety factors we talked about those um our uh and we've introduced axial deformation and gone over how to apply that in its basic form and and use superposition and then use um, the integral form of it for continuously changing variables with length. Um, so that's, uh, that's all for this lecture and I will see you again in the next lecture, lecture four.